And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Tom Gilbert, and I'm the campaign director for energy, climate, and natural resources with the New Jersey Conservation Foundation. And we are so pleased to be joining Duke Farms in uh, hosting this important conversation regarding the research uh, conducted there at Duke Farms on deer management and its implications for uh, health of our forests and for carbon sequestration. Um, deer management has been a longstanding perennial challenge in New Jersey to say the least. And obviously it has profound implications for the health of our forests and the many values that they provide from clean air and water to wildlife habitat and recreation. Now we add to that the urgent issue of climate change. And if you consider that New Jersey's forests currently sequester about 8% of our annual greenhouse gas emissions, um, there's a lot at stake here uh, in terms of the health of our forests. New Jersey DEP's recent Global Warming Response Act 80 by 50 report calls for not only uh, maintaining the carbon stored in our forests, but actually uh, increasing carbon sequestration as one of seven strategies that will be needed to, to meet our emissions reductions um, uh, targets under that act, which is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% um, economy-wide from 2006 levels by, by 2050. But unfortunately, the lack of regeneration in our forests due to unsustainable populations of deer seriously calls into question the state's ability to meet these, uh, these climate and, and carbon goals. But the good news is that this research shows that there is hope and there are techniques that can be used successfully to manage and reduce deer and allow our, uh, our, uh, our forests and native plants to regenerate. And so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first panel who will walk us through this important research. And I think we're really fortunate to have um, these three folks speak with us today, um, not just about this research, but because of their kind of vast expertise and experience uh, on these issues. So <clears throat> we're joined by Tom Allmendinger, who's the Director of Natural Resources and Agroecology for Duke Farms, the Duke Farms Foundation. And at Duke Farms, he developed and uh, continues to direct a large scale landscape restoration program on over, 20, on over 2,700 acres. That includes uh, a range of habitats, uh, supporting nearly 30 species of wildlife um, listed as threatened and endangered in New Jersey. And Tom has uh, a, a degree in forestry from SUNY, College of Environmental Science and Forestry, as well as a degree in ecology and natural resources from uh, the Cook College at Rutgers and his Master of Science in Ecology and Evolution from the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences at Rutgers. We're also joined by uh, Dr. Jay Kelly, who is Professor of Biology and Environmental Science and co-director of the Center for Environmental Studies at the Raritan Valley Community College. Since 2014, Dr. Kelly and his students have studied over 300 forest patches in central and northern New Jersey, documenting how forest understories have changed uh, since the mid 20th century as a result of overabundant deer, invasive species, uh, land use history, and other factors. Dr. Kelly holds a PhD in ecology and evolutionary, um, at ecology and evolution, and a BA in biology from Rutgers University. And he received a certificate of special congressional recognition for his research uh, and service in 2010. We're also joined by uh, Mike Van Cleff with Ecological Solutions, LLC. Mike has a PhD in ecology and over 30 years of experience working on the stewardship of rare and invasive plant species, white-tailed deer management, forest and grassland restorations, ecological health, uh, monitoring and natural resource policy. Mike prepared the New Jersey Strategic Management Plan for Invasive Species. He served on the Hopewell Township Deer Management Advisory Committee and he acts as the stewardship director for the Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space and program director for uh, New Jersey, the New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team. So as you can see, uh, we've got a wealth of um, knowledge and experience and expertise on this issue. And so uh, it's my pleasure to, to turn it over to, uh, to our panelists. Thank you, Tom. Um, this is Tom. Uh, I'll be kicking off the, uh, the three of us. Um, 
I'm going to be focusing mostly from my perspective on the, uh, the deer management program and um, kind of the history and the background of all that. Uh, and then we'll be followed by Mike Van Clef, who will be uh, discussing the vegetation response that we've seen on site and the trajectory and how that's changed throughout time with our deer management program. And we'll be culminating with Jay Kelly talking about uh, the regional context of all those sites that he's been has been monitoring with his students and how Duke Farm stacks up historically and currently against those spots and and some of it's pretty stark. Uh, I want to thank you for um, let me share my screen real quick. Get this up and rolling. If I can get. Hold on one second. Can't seem to get the screen to work. There we go. Uh, I, I do want to, oops, what's going on? I do want to thank you all for taking the time out of your day today to come listen to us uh, and to hopefully discuss with us a, a really critical management tool, uh, which I think is really vital for all of us who manage lands in our region and in our state. And, uh, and I would argue across much of the white-tailed deer range outside of New Jersey. Um, as Nora pointed out, this is like um, the culmination of nearly two decades of effort uh, and monitoring. And uh, the article and today's uh, discussions are, that, are, like, are, like, are like the cream of the crop for me. It's a, a point of pride, and I, I don't know if it's pride of more than just feeling satisfied that we've actually done this work and actually did the science behind it to show the differences that we can make in uh, properly managing deer. So uh, the problem, you know, we had a problem, obviously, when I, uh, prior to managing the deer herd here at Duke Farms. And the, um, the goal of the research that we're talking about today was to evaluate uh, how our deer management uh, reduction and our, our population uh, management affects forest regeneration and, and the native story of development uh, of our forest patches. Uh, that's what we're talking about today. We look across the, the spectrum of habitats at Duke Farms, but we're focusing on the forest patches today. Um, and our goal really was to reduce the herd size from the get-go uh, to benefit native plant communities and to and the associated wildlife um, and the impacts that all had that had prior to us managing deer. So I'll be running through my, my piece. I'll be running through the history, like I said, and the planning and the utilization of all the different techniques we can use, and uh, a little bit of why I think we have been successful in our deer management over the last uh, 18 years, give or take. And uh, I'll briefly touch on vegetation response, uh, particularly the first spring and summer following our initial call. But I don't want to take away too much thunder from the other two speakers. Um, this is just a chart that shows the. Uh, uh, the deer densities beginning in 2004, inside and outside of the deer exposure, which I'll get into in a second, um, but they follow the same general pattern. Um, a heavy call in the beginning, the first year, and then followed by the oscillations and, and maintenance kind of hunting. So Duke Farms historically, uh, as you can see from this 1935 aerial, was a very agricultural area. Uh, the forests were um, removed, the soils were manipulated, um, and if you look at the central eastern part of the map there, you'll see the, uh, the, the park of the estate, uh, which was loaded with uh, exotic plants from across the globe from our globe setting benefactors. So we had the perfect storm here at Duke Farms uh, that was developing through decades um, and created a situation that was un untenable uh, when I arrived here in 2001. Uh, uh, real briefly, the, you know, the story of uh, white-tailed deer uh, in North America, and particularly in New Jersey, they were virtually extirpated in 1900, uh, beginning of the 1900s, um, and climbed to about four deer per kilometer squared um, in 1972, which is interesting because I'll get to it later, but Marty McHugh uh, told us a story about him driving through here um, in the 70s as a young, uh, a young boy running, going to his grandfather's farm and seeing the Serengeti. So arguably, I think we had problems here with deer earlier than most parts of the state. So we've had a, a long history of deer issues. Part of that issue is also um, urbanization, development, industrialization. This is a current 
uh, Google map I pulled up of the, you could see the encroachment development all around us. Um, uh, so obviously we are an oasis for all different species, including deer. Um, I stole this just to give you kind of context of where we are. I borrowed this from Rick Lathrop. Um, and it shows, I, I tried to get more current data. This is only goes from 72 to 2001. But if you look over underneath the, the M, E, and the R, that's Duke Farms. So I was born in 1971, and that's the beginning of this map. And you can see as the red encroaches around, that's the development of urbanization around us. So kind of exacerbated the issue. And to that point, uh, Dr. Robert Warren from University of Georgia, he is an expert on wildlife and particularly deer. Um, his, his, his quote here, during the 20th century, populations you know, went from locally extirpated to overabundant. And that's true of Duke Farms and of most of New Jersey. And there's a prime example. Here's a, a five-acre photo, roughly, of a field at Duke Farms prior to deer management. And there's 30 deer in that picture. Um, that's the kind of situation that Marty was referring to as he drove through. Um, that's what we started with. Uh, I'll give you a second to uh, kind of read over this yourselves, um, but I think it's it's really important message here. Um, it's gone unheeded for way too long. This is 18 years old already, and I'm sure it's go been going on much longer than that. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, if whatever forest values you hold dear, deer are negatively impacting them right now. Um, so whether it's recreation, ecological things, hunting, animal, you know, all those things. Uh, they're negatively impacted by the overabundant deer. Very typical picture of what Duke Farms looked like prior to uh, any lethal management at Duke Farms. You see a canopy of non-native species and uh, an understory of non-native species. Linguonymus, nori maple, stiltgrass, barberry, and nothing habitat-wise, uh, valuable-wise. We didn't even have chipmunks or rabbits breeding on the property because there was no cover. Um, it was pretty, pretty depauperate. Uh, and if we did have understory, it looked like this. Um, it was, you know, dominated by, as most of you in the Piedmont and the Highlands know, some of the forests are pretty dominated by Japanese barberry. Um, as I mentioned earlier, DF was, Duke Forest was the perfect microcosm for New Jersey, um, uh, the perfect storm. And it's a, kind of a microcosm of what's happened in New Jersey, you know, with the disturbed soils, Overabundant deer, exotic plants. You know, we are at the hub of many international seaports, so uh, New Jersey's at the forefront of a lot of this. Um, and without reducing the herd, recruitment and establishment of native species becomes uh, impossible, and uh, restoration efforts really are hindered by uh, the lack of deer management. So, uh, where do we? How do we get there? How do we? How do we get to the position where we were at in 2001 when I got here? Well, there was never any deer management on the property, so to speak. There was, you know, probably poachers or people that stuck on the property when Doris was on vacation, uh, but really no true deer management ever occurred. Um, prior to lethal management, we had over 80 deer per kilometer, uh, square kilometer, which is um, leaps and bounds above the three to five uh, deer per kilometer square that's recommended for ecological integrity. Uh, in fact, it was so bad, deer were beginning to suffer from malnutrition. Um, so, um, we finally impressed upon our board that we needed to take drastic measures, and we worked with the state, uh, DEP, Fish and Game, um, and a whole host of other people from Rutgers and other agencies to develop an integrated plan. And I'll go through these real quickly and individually, but we basically wanted to utilize as many options as we could to uh, maximize our effort. Um, exclusionary fencing uh, doesn't, isn't appropriate for everything, but sometimes it is. Uh, we installed our initial 640-acre exposure in 1999, uh, and two years later we installed a 33-acre exposure inside that 640-acre uh, exposure which gave us the ability to kind of compare regeneration rates with little or no herbivory uh, versus known populations outside the fence. And that's very helpful as we get into the data that Jay and Mike will share with you. Um, professional sharpshooting, again, not a tool that everyone can use, but it's a tool that we were able to utilize. Uh, we had that inside that fence, there was uh, 
staff members living on site, um, and several staff members living on site. So we had to make sure that we were making uh, uh, the whole procedure very safe and efficient. Uh, we were able to um, bring the deer herd down to zero in three evenings uh, with sharpshooters. Uh, so we took out 225 deer from a square, uh, the one square mile fencing in one, uh, in three evenings. And uh, we maintained that zero free, uh, zero deer per square mile density for until Hurricane Sandy. Uh, uh, but our, our, our biggest uh, bang for our buck, no pun intended, uh, was that we used a controlled management hunt with volunteers, and that's been our bread and butter, and that's what most of uh, the groups and people we're talking to today will utilize. Um, this is actually Larry Harity. He was uh, the chief of fishing game at the time, and he was very involved, with, as was his staff. We wanted to make sure we were on the up and up with all of that. Um, we have uh, a, a really good screening process. We started with initially with 350 applicants, and we got down to um, 70 the first year, and today we're down to about 15 uh, participants. Um, and that's mostly because you find out through these long-term projects that most of your deer are harvested by three to five of your top flight uh, volunteers. So we, you know, one of the things we do, we have highly skilled, proficient shooting. We have to make sure they pass a proficiency test every two years. Uh, they, they can't have any pr former priors from fishing game or fire, from a firearms perspective. And I just want to point this out. This is my shot with the 75 yards with a shotgun that wasn't mine. And to prove to the hunters that it wasn't that hard because I am not a skilled or practiced hunter, so they should be able to do it as well. Uh, agricultural depredation is a huge thing for us. Um, I, over the past couple weeks, I heard some talk about how the soybean farmers are losing almost 30% of their crops from deer browse every year. Um, and a local story, we have a, a neighboring farm, uh, the Everett Farm, who used to acquire a depredation permit every year, but because we've been so successful over the last 18 years, they haven't had to uh, utilize any depredation over there because the numbers are so low that they're seeing okay results. Uh, this, is a, this is really our uh, part of our management team tool that is vital. Uh, we would never really be able to uh, reach our goals um, if we did not use this piece of uh, this, this tool uh, annually, if we didn't if we didn't do this, it's basically a coordinated effort. We get together before uh, the event, discuss a strategy where we uh, move deer from one locale towards uh, the hunters, in an organized you know radio contact at all times, safe. Um, but these are really um, efficient, and we've uh, actually harvested up to 40 deer in one day doing this, so it's very effective and efficient. So that's kind of the plan and the integration that we use to get as many pieces together. But why have we been successful? And this is my, these are my opinions. Um, first of all, clear objectives. You need to, the participants to understand and embrace your goals. And for us, it was restoration of the habitats. Uh, you need to set expectations, uh, which I uh, uh, equate to annual harvest goals for them to, to focus on. Um, and we do heavily focus on reproductive age females, and this is still a major shift in the paradigm for many of the seasoned hunters out there um, who were, were taught that shooting does was a no-no, um, but it's, it's imperative. Um, and this is just a quick way, a uh, quick little chart of what I use to set up uh, harvest goals. It's basically I take the population that we estimate uh, with the FLIR um, estimation every winter and run it through some State uh, averages as far as winter mortality, fecundity, birth rate, you know, fawn survivability, and then basically pick a target production. Uh, just to give you an idea, if you don't reduce your herd by 40% every year, you're losing ground. So you need to at least go 40% or greater every year to reduce the herd. And you can see those numbers on the on highlighted in yellow. This is from 2011. Communicating and coordinating is also a huge. We, you know, if you have a property like as big as ours or bigger, it's really good to divide it into manageable zones. Consider a lead volunteer that you can work with that you trust and is part of the team. Uh, he's kind of a, a he or she is kind of a, a, a go between between the hunters and the management, and uh, provide reinforcement for good effort uh, and enforce rules with zero tolerance, which we've had to do many times. Uh, here's the zones, 
QDM principles, incentivizing the program, QDM, quality deer management is really to, to, to grow bigger bucks. Uh, this only became into a play, and it was a little bit tough for me to swallow at first, but when, when our numbers got so low, uh, it was an opportunity to try to keep uh, seats in the stands more often. If there, uh, if there was a bigger buck running around, they may spend more time in the stand to continue to harvest. Oops. Uh, you know, challenging them by posting who's participating, who's harvesting deer. We also provide materials for baiting, which runs about $2,000 a year, and butchering fees to qualified butchers to donate the venison to keep them harvesting deer, and that's also around $2,000 a year. And we've donated uh, 17 tons of venison in our, in our, during our time. Uh, which equates to, I believe, uh, 136,000 four-ounce portions or meals, basically. Monitoring is huge, data collection, sharing, harvest data. Um, what we're talking about today, ha tracking the habitat health, utilizing vegetation and wildlife utilization, and post-management population estimation through FLIR, which we'll talk about. And I will wrap up by just showing you a few quick pictures of pretty flowers and plants. Um, these are the three maple leaf viburnums that existed on this property prior to deer management. Um, they only survived because they were in a uh, dog pen. Um, and what's really sad about that is that the dominant understory shrub in this region should have been this plant and the fact that we had three on about 800 acres of woodland is pretty pathetic. Uh, but I will give you an update that they are spreading naturally, and there's dozens and dozens in this woodlot now, so that's a positive perspective. But following the first heavy cull, all these long-lived spring ephemerals, which you never saw flower before, began popping up, like this bloodroot, these sil uh, Virginia bluebells in the floodplain, Dutchman's breeches, orchids in the summer, which we never saw flower, probably for up, up various reasons, but one of them is deer herbivory. Uh, native uh, tree regeneration, um, Michael, Mike will tell you more about this situation here you're seeing with the board in the background. Uh, and this is kind of our goal, a stratified forest with, you know, vertical layers and, and a full uh, habitat for, for species to exist and, and thrive. And uh, this is, I believe, Cushitan Mountain Preserve uh, on the backside of uh, Round Valley. And we've done plenty of research. Uh, around deer at Duke Farms, and if anyone's interested, I can probably follow up with you later. And this is a list of the other five or so research papers we've done with deer at Duke Farms. And with that, I will pass it over to Mike to give you, Mike and Jay to give you details about the really exciting stuff, what's happened since we've managed deer. Mike, take it away. The long and short of it is it worked. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, share some numbers with you and some, some figures and such to give you an idea. <clears throat> so the methods, pretty quickly, I'm going to hit the methods. There's 14 different named areas. Most of them had a post-agricultural um, history, as Tom mentioned earlier, and there was a couple of exceptions. So some were uh, older forest types. Um, plus, there was extensive. There was areas where there was extensive non-native planting of non-native trees. So that's the starting point. Uh, we started in 2008. The paper covers through 2019. Uh, every year we measure about 100 points. Uh, for any particular spot, we do one point per two acres. We measure at a return rate of every three to five years. Uh, the points are randomly selected from a 30-meter grid. And when we take measurements, they're 10 meters from the center point of, uh, of the plot. So there's two basic methods. We use the forest secchi method, which is measuring woody plants within the brow zone. And then we did ground plots for presence and absence of native and non-native herbs, graminoids, and woody seedlings. Just to give you an idea of, you know, this is the upcoming year for us, but you know, we, every year we do a certain number of um, named areas and it, we do grasslands and shrublands and things like that as well, but the paper only covers uh, forests. And this is what it looks like when we're out there taking the measurements. Charles is uh, the hub, the data hub. 
and he collects some data while we run out uh, the boards 10 meters from the center plot. So you can see, you know, in this case, we're measuring how many of these have something green in front of them that's from a woody plant. So in this case, it would be all 16 of the grids on the Secchi board um, have something green in front of them. And then the ground plot, you know, this is this would be a, a really nice ground plot with some good, you know, tree seedlings coming up in it. But we just do presence and absence, native or non-native. We don't identify down to the level of species. All right, the results. So yeah, this is kind of the big one here. Inside the exclosure, native cover went from 23% to 72%. That's almost a 5% gain in cover per year inside the deer exclosure. Outside the deer exclosure, still dramatic improvement, but less than half of the rate. Uh, Non-native plants um, also increased, and that was almost exclusively due to multiflora rows, which does receive a certain amount of browse uh, relative to most certainly like barberry or something like that. Um, but um, they increased um, not as much within the exclosure compared to natives and a little bit more outside the exclosure, but fairly similar to natives inside and outside. So, you know, on this curve here, you know, there's, do there's dotted lines are all the individual areas. So there's 14 different areas. So, you know, you can see how the variation is from area to area here, but you know, the, the native plant cover is just absolutely amazing. It's that logistic curve. So it might be starting to level out now, it might go up a little bit more, but it's, it's about to level out. Outside the native plants are had very slow recovery, a huge lag time. And now they're starting to pick up in that sort of exponential kind of way. Um, so that's the story with the, the native plants um, inside and outside. The non-native plants, sort of a similar, but a little bit quicker recovery for the non-native plants outside but a very similar shape to these two curves. Um, and then inside, it's like you're looking at part of the native graph, right? It, it's like stopping like here. And when you have 72% native cover <clears throat> inside the exclosure, you have to wonder how high can this really go? You know, will this keep going like this or will it go like this or will it go like this and then start dropping? Because you know, we, we obviously time will tell uh, what happens at Duke. And um, the another way of expressing it is a ratio of native to non-native cover. So within the exclosure, it went from 1.1 to 1.4. So the proportion of native plants is increasing inside the exclosure, but it's also increasing outside the exclosure. You know, no one ever dreams that we're going to get rid of all invasive plants. Well, yeah, I do dream about that, but. Um, the hope is that at least you have a higher proportion of native plants than non-native plants and ever increasing, ideally. Um, so the grasses, not much change uh, for the native species. You know, these lines are relatively flat. The non-exclosed area did go up of some and essentially no change inside. So grasses didn't respond, uh, which you might, sort of expect there to be a muted response because um, grasses are generally deer resistant. However, the non-native plants, this, this is, you know, this is, this is, this is the stuff, man. Um, this is the, the non-native grasses inside the exposure crashing. So the Japanese still grass just cannot compete with all of that shrub layer activity and it just crashes you know, not a drop of herbicide, it just goes away. You reduce the deer and the still grass, which appeared to be, you know, unbelievably competitive, nothing could grow through it, sure it can. If you stop the deer or reduce the deer, now everything grows above the still grass, the still grass goes away. Um, outside, it's steady for now, the grasses, um, but that's because the native, the, the woody cover, native and non-native, outside is significantly less, so it hasn't reached that threshold point where it could suppress the still grass. And then the herbaceous cover, again, sort of not really much going on here, 
And part of that is probably because there really was, as Tom was mentioning, virtually no native herbs to, to, um, at the outset. And it just the seed sources were eliminated for many species, even common ones. Um, and then the non-native species, they're actually, and I would never do it this way again, but we were considering Japanese honeysuckle runners creeping as part of the herb layer, even though they weren't an herb. Um, and that totally screwed things up. I wish I had never done it that way. But regardless, um, one thing that does seem to be clear is that honeysuckle does get eaten a bit. So it actually has been increasing. Um, there really is, it is really the most significant thing in the herb layer. Okay, so, you know, just wrapping it up with some pictures, you know, this is what, you know, a healthy forest looks like, you know, this is, this is what, what all of our goals are. Um, there's still places that do farms that look like this, though, you know, this is outside the exposure, but, you know, you still get these nasty, you know, sea of still grass. But, you know, things are, you can see things at all levels of recovery. You know, so this is sort of an early recovery where the tree seedlings are just starting to float above the still grass. You know, and then when you get a full dense layer of tree saplings, in this case, the still grass goes away. Um, even in canopy gaps, which are notorious for harboring st um, <clears throat> still grass, you get you're getting tree seedlings, and they are eventually going to outcompete the still grass. You know, even in old fields heavily infested, this one, um, you know, larger canopy gaps, I meant to say, uh, you have Japanese barberry here, but guess who's going to win? The pin oak. You know, you, you get the deer off of it and the native species, lo and behold, uh, having lived here for millennia, show themselves to be competitive. Um, in more shaded settings, this is barberry in here. It's getting absolutely just swallowed up by the native vegetation. Invasive plants are not, you know, um, supernatural. <laughs> they they can be outcompeted. You know, and, and spice bush. Tommy mentioned the maple leaf viburnum spice bush is also quite uncommon, but there are thickets of it forming here and there on the property. And native herbs. This is pretty much the only stand <laughs> of, of any significance of wreath goldenrod. You know, there should be countless millions on the property, but there's only, there's very few places where it's located at all. And that's all I have. All right, so I believe I'm next up to present and I have to apologize if you can hear my dog crying in the background, she's terrified of thunderstorms and there's one moving over her head right now. Um, all right, so we started uh, studying the forest at Duke Farms in 2016 as part of a larger project studying forest understory health throughout the region. Um, and we studied, we began by working on five different forest patches inside the exposure and five patches outside the exposure. Um, and we we're interested not just in seeing the difference inside and out, but how the uh, deer management at Duke Farms really compared to the broader region. Um, as, as part of this study. So as you've heard, we've studied over 300 different forest patches in central and northern New Jersey in the past seven years. And we pulled from that study um, some reference data sets that we thought would be useful to compare the success um, at Duke Farms relative to the broader region. So the blue dots that you can see here in the map indicate um, forest study sites today that are comparable to Duke Farms that occur on similar soils and landscape contexts as, as you find at Duke. Uh, and the red dots indicate places that were studied historically by Rutgers researchers around the mid 20th century. And the, the beauty of that reference data set is that all of that data was collected prior to the deer populations exploding to the levels that we see today. So it's really an invaluable um, kind of look back in time to see what things look like and maybe should look like today or could look like if we bring deer back under control. Uh, and so I'll be moving back and forth between those different uh, data sets to, uh, for comparison to gauge the success of Duke. Um, in general, as you heard from uh, Tom, although he was talking about square kilometers, uh, historically there were about 10 deer per square mile in New Jersey um, around that historical time period, the mid 20th century. 
And you can see this picture from uh, Hutchison Memorial Forest that Rutgers runs. In the early 1970s, all the healthy you know, layers of the forest are there from ferns on the forest floor to shrubs and so forth with lots of regeneration of trees. And our forest today in central New Jersey usually look like one of the two pictures on the right with either nothing in the understory as a result of overbrows or uh, they're chock full of invasives because deer prefer to eat them uh, the least. Um, and our studies of deer populations in the area today in central New Jersey show an average of about 112 deer per square mile. So we have more than 10 times the number of deer on average as we did back in the 1970s when this historical data was collected. Now, the problems with deer overabundance are not limited to New Jersey. This is really a regional phenomenon. And you can see here from this research from the University of Georgia that by the late 1980s, much of the Eastern United States had deer populations in excess of 30 per square mile. That's the red that you can see in the map there. Um, and so these problems that we see today are, are a much bigger time and spatial scales than um, we, we get to experience as we go walk through the woods. And that's really kind of invaluable for perspective and for context. Some recent studies by the U.S. Forest Service found that, uh, as you would expect, browse levels throughout the forests of the eastern states are um, exceptional, with the worst levels of browse taking place in the mid-Atlantic region where the deer populations are highest, uh, primarily in the northeast corridor from Boston down to D.C. And you can see that in those places, almost 80 percent of the forests uh, that the U.S. Forest Service studies have either moderate to severe levels of browse. Another study by U.S. Forest Service uh, researchers found that the places with the highest numbers of deer have the highest uh, impacts to regeneration. So when you get above 15 deer per square mile, you start to see impacts to the large seedling and sapling layer, uh, as you would expect. And um, our, our data basically supported all these things that are being found elsewhere in the country. So when you look at uh, forest understory changes from past to present in terms of tree regeneration, you break it down into different size categories of trees. And obviously the smallest, youngest trees are the most vulnerable to deer, um, the small seedlings that you see there on the left. Well, the problem is that's not a very good indicator of deer browse because those numbers are replenished every year because seeds are continually falling from the canopy. They're basically just sprouts of the year. Um, the best indicator of deer browse in the short term is the next category, the large seedlings, because it takes typically between two and 10 years for a tree growing up under a forest canopy to age out of that size class. So you've got trees that are anywhere from a foot tall to maybe up to 10 feet tall, and for nearly 10 years, they may well be vulnerable to deer browse, to buck rub, and so forth. Um, and as you can see here, we saw the most dramatic declines in that age category from past to present, 80% declines in that case. And we even saw declines in the next size category of trees, the sapling layer. And this is a little bit surprising because the deer can't actually reach these trees, uh, at least the, the, um, the foliage. Um, trees that are an inch in diameter typically have their leaves more than 10 feet above the ground. So while they might experience some damage from buck rub, um, they're not being browsed in the same way as the smaller trees are. And the fact that we're seeing this level of decline in the sapling layer basically is an indicator that we have excessive browse that's been going on for decades, more than 10 years. And the real concern here is that if these trends continue, there aren't gonna be enough young trees in the understory to replace the older trees as they die out, either from old age or pests and diseases, uh, physical disturbances from storms, all of these things are increasing these days. And you can actually see this playing out in small scales in throughout the region. So local forests in our area around Bridgewater and Raritan, for example, as the ash forests have been dying out from, from emerald ash borer, there's nothing in the understory to replace them, either nothing but invasive grasses or shrubs and vines um, because the deer are leaving those and eating all the young trees. And so we may, we, may, we may well begin to see a decline in forest cover in the future if these trends continue and we can't uh, begin to tackle these kinds of problems on a larger scale. We also saw changes from past to present in, in other understory vegetation. Um, you know, in the mid 20th century, it was majority native species with very little invasive cover. Today, we have roughly equal numbers of natives and invasives in the best quality forests. And in our post-agricultural forests, which are not presented here, the, num the amount of invasive species are, are on average double the amount of native species. So we're seeing really radical changes in forest understories that really need to be addressed through forest management moving forward through the kinds of things like you're seeing here at Duke. And our data from the, the Duke forest plots showed that there really were clear signs of success. So this, this slide's a little bit more complicated, but basically the dark gray bars indicate the historic data set that we showed you. The next gray, uh, kind of medium gray bar is a subset of that data showing just the Piedmont data set. So the, the places from the historic data set that had similar soils as Duke. The, the light gray bar in the middle is uh, the, those same forests today throughout the region surrounding Duke. 
and then you have inside and outside the exclosure. So again, the small seedlings are not really something that's very useful to look at because those are uh, very variable. But you can see here that uh, by uh, after 12 years of forest recovery following deer management, that inside the exclosure, you actually had a dramatic increase in large seedlings that even surpassed the amount that occurred historically when deer numbers were much lower. Um, and even outside the exclosure, the levels of large seedlings rose to roughly the same amounts that we found historically. So we see as uh, basically complete success in terms of those early signs of uh, recovery of forest regeneration. But um, on the right, you can see that in the sapling layer, those larger trees that typically take 10 to 20 years to grow under shade, we didn't necessarily have very good recovery of those at that time. But we could see as we went out there and collected this data that these large seedlings, many of them were really just right at the point of aging up into that next size category. So we went back out over the past year to recollect this data. And we can see that after 16, 17 years, not only do we have complete recovery of the large seedling size class, but complete recovery of the sapling layer as well. And so really the, the work that's going on at Duke Farms is really bringing tree, tree reproduction back into the levels uh, that it needs to be to help sustain these forests into the future. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see how uh, this plays out um, on into the future. Uh, the, the work that we see here at Duke Farms really kind of paralleled uh, that broader data set. We looked at other exclosures in the region and we found very similar levels of large seedlings coming back in these areas, again, equivalent to historic densities. Places where uh, management hunting was occurring elsewhere um, also showed major signs of improvement in the large seedling layer. And places that were either hunted just through recreational hunting alone or no hunting at all had next to no regeneration occurring um, in, in that large seedling category. We also saw major improvements, as Mike was talking about, in other types of um, forest understory vegetation. The native woody vines, which we call lianas, increased dramatically uh, compared to the, the invasive species, which are in orange there. In the uh, herb layer, we saw major increases in the native species as well. But again, uh, as, as Tom was talking, the, the shrub layer had been depleted for so long, there just wasn't a, much of a native seed source around. So even though um, the, these places have been protected from deer, uh, it was the invasive shrub species that were able to take advantage of that because there's so many more seeds around in the landscape for them to recover than the natives. And so it might be the case that to improve the shrub layer in our forests, they might need a little extra help besides just taking the deer out either through augmenting uh, the forest with plantings or doing some other kind of measures to speed up the recovery of the shrub layer. Now we didn't study this, but um, based on what we've seen from similar kinds of research elsewhere in the country, um, it's reasonable to expect that these sorts of improvements to uh, forest vegetation at Duke Farms probably translated into benefits for wildlife as well. There's been a lot of really good research over the past two or three years that have shown, unfortunately, uh, severe declines in uh, both invertebrates as well as in bird populations since the 1960s and 70s, not just in North America, but in Europe as well. Um, and these kinds of efforts can actually do a lot to help combat these declines. So with bird populations, for example, our forest birds have declined anywhere from 15 to 20% on average compared to the 1960s. Insect populations have declined by as much as 80% um, in many regions. And we can see from other research in Pennsylvania, for example, this is a, a classic study from the Allegheny National Forest where they set up deer enclosures where they kept deer at different populations inside these large scale enclosures. And they found that as deer densities increased, tree diversity declined dramatically. And as a result, the insect populations declined as well because insects tend to specialize on particular plant species as food sources. So depending on what kinds of insects you're looking at, it was declines of anywhere from 40 to 80%. Um, and then because most of our forest birds are insectivorous either entirely or at certain stages of their life cycle, they also saw dramatic declines in bird densities as well. Um, and ecologists refer to this as cascade effects where basically one thing happens at least to a chain of events throughout the food web uh, like a waterfall, and that's what the word cascade means. Um, there are also uh, impacts to wildlife in terms of where they nested and other resources that forests provide. So this is a really nice case study from some friends of mine that were in grad school with me at Rutgers, uh, and this is from the Rutgers Research Forest, where they looked at uh, bird population changes since the 1980s and found that 100% of the ground and shrub nesting bird species have declined significantly since that time period. And it's for the same kinds of reasons. There's no shrubs and cover for them to nest in. Uh, and so the habitat is gone and the bird populations have disappeared. Uh, and they even saw some significant declines in the mid canopy nesters as well. Whereas the species that nested in the, the top of the forest in the, the tree canopies had no noticeable effects. In fact, many of them increased significantly since that same, same time period. 
And this is just one little forest patch of about 40 acres of old growth forest uh, in central New Jersey nearby. But similar kinds of uh, um, phenomenon were found recently on very large scales in Pennsylvania. So this is a study of forest breeding birds that just came out last year in Pennsylvania showing that at the same time as deer populations increased since the 1980s, the, um, the forest canopy birds increased as well, but those that were nesting on the ground, whether they be in interior forests or in early successional forests, they continued to uh, decline or exhibit the same low levels. Um, and so it's showing basically, indirectly at least, impacts of um, deer on, uh, on these habitats that are affecting birds based on where they need to breed. There's been similar cascade effects documented recently uh, in terms of how invasive species impact the food web. Again, because insects in particular specialize on these plants. When a, a non-native species moves in and takes over the forest, you start to see declines in all of the native arthropods that depend on the leaf litter, uh, the pollinators, um, the predators of those other insects, they all begin to decline either directly or indirectly as a result. And um, some of the best re research that I've seen comes from Doug Tallamy at the University of Delaware, who's looked at the benefits of native uh, plants for Lepidopteran species in their caterpillar stages and compared them to invasive species. And so this is just a subset of his data. And you can see that our native species in, that are in green here, like our elms, support hundreds of different moth and butterfly caterpillars. And closely related species uh, from other parts of the world that are being planted around here, or in some cases, spreading wildly into our forests, do very little, if anything, to support uh, these same species as food resources. Um, and so while it might be green and growing and providing some benefits to us, for these species that are looking for something to eat, there, there's nothing there, and it might as well be a desert. Um, you can also see impacts to deer in the physical environment in the forest. We've been, begun to do some look, uh, research into the microclimates of forest environments at Duke and elsewhere in the region. And we looked at a gradient of understory conditions inside and outside the exclosure at Duke, and we could see major changes to things like the um, temperature conditions and relative humidity conditions at different layers of the forest understory. Um, there, I believe some folks will be talking later about carbon sequestration. Forest understories from the research that I've seen tend to uh, comprise about anywhere from three to 12% of the carbon stored in these understories. Um, and a recent study looked at the effects of deer exposures at improving the situation and found that after 16 to 18 years, you had major increases of carbon stored in that sapling layer that we talked about earlier. Um, so real potential benefits for um, carbon sequestration in the future as well, which is obviously a major concern. And lastly, there's uh, potential benefits for water quality as well. There's been a lot of research out at uh, Yellowstone National Park that looked at how the decline in herbivores that took place following wolf reintroduction um, corresponded to major improvements to vegetation and changes to river morphology and hydrological conditions of various kinds. And it's reasonable to believe that as our vegetation recovers in response to deer management at Duke or on larger scales, uh, like you see in Yellowstone, the reintroduction of natural predators, um, we could see benefits in water quality come from that as well as the vegetation filters the water as it moves through the watershed. Um, and this is not, it's common sense and some of the earliest in founding fathers of uh, wildlife management had the same things in mind. They began to implement these kinds of measures. So the, one of the founding fathers, the guy that originally wrote the book on wildlife management, Aldo Leopold, um, spoke to these um, potential effects in his you know, landmark book, The Sand County Almanac, uh, and how the ultimately the long-term results of us getting rid of these predators from the landscape is that the vegetation declines and our soil washes into the sea as a result. Um, so that's just a whirlwind tour through some of the research that we did at Duke Farms and some of the picture contexts, both from New Jersey and throughout the region. Um, lots of people to thank. Uh, mostly my students that collected all this data and did a phenomenal job. I have a list of references from a lot of this research in case anybody's interested in looking further into it. I could provide you with the references um, directly or if there's other dimensions we didn't talk about, I can share that as well. Um, and thank you for your interest and attention to the subject. It's a really important uh, issue that we're facing. Thanks very much, Tom and Mike and Jay for sharing that research and your your expertise on these issues in general. And I think it really is encouraging and it's clear that the research at Duke Farms um, and the deer management techniques there uh, were, were clear, clearly successful in reducing the herd um, and leading to um, you know, market changes in regeneration of the forest and, and, and native plants, both inside the exclosure um, and outside as well, you know, to, to a lesser degree. And, and so that's 
again, um, uh, a hopeful sign. Um, we do we do have a number of questions and um, certainly too many too many uh, to, to get to. Um, but there's one in particular that I wanted to raise because I think it's um, kind of uh, one of the, the key issues that I think um, questions that's raised around this research. And so this is a question from Hazel. And she says, in areas with large forest patches and meaningful financial resources, effective deer control is obviously possible. In suburban towns such as ours, where there are a few spots uh, larger than um, 450 feet from habitation and towns have zero hunting, but many deer, how do we move municipalities toward deer management solutions? What are your suggestions to address soaring deer numbers in the uh, in, in the burbs and peri-urban areas? Anyone on the panel want to tackle that one? Well, I can say that one of the um, things that tends to be most convincing to local officials that we've presented our, our research to is not the effects and the benefits for local forests and ecosystems, but the benefits for public safety, for um, economic benefits for farmers and for public health in terms of Lyme disease, none of which we talked about, but all of which are connected to the deer story as well. Uh, local townships around here, according to the state farm insurance data, show that in central New Jersey, towns are spending on average about a million dollars in vehicle damage a year, and just the vehicle damage alone as a result of deer vehicle collisions. Um, State Farm estimates that on average, uh, it costs about $4,000 worth of vehicle damage for every deer vehicle collision that uh, is reported to them. Um, and that's how they get those numbers. And the problem is that we're paying through these things, you know, little by little individually, and the bigger picture um, is something that we're not generally aware of. And the studies that, that Tom participated in with um, Princeton and Bernard's Township earlier in the 2000s found that when deer management like this is um, implemented at, in those townships, that you see concurrent declines in deer vehicle collisions. So in Princeton, for example, when they implemented sharpshooting in the early 2000s, I think they dropped the deer population by 60% in the first year and deer vehicle collisions declined by 60% in that same year. And so that translates into immediate economic and safety benefits for the public. I mean, people are dying. Um, I've hit four deer myself in the past 10 years. None of them are a part of those statistics because I, it was below my deductible. Uh, so I had to pay out of pocket for it. Um, but these things are, are affecting us in all kinds of ways. And we've seen just in terms of public perception, um, a greater appreciation of the effects that deer are having in our communities from our gardens and our landscaping to our uh, concerns about Lyme disease that it isn't as much of a, a hard sell as it might've been 20 years ago to convince people that this is a problem. Now, what to do about that problem is not something that I'm particularly well versed in, but folks like Tom and Mike have much more experience and might have better ideas for how to implement effective deer management in those urban areas and in communities um, where they work. Tom, did you want to comment? Looks like you were trying to comment on that. No, I was just gonna say, Mike, since Mike is so involved with the township wide, um, management on his own, he might have a better perspective than me since I'm kind of <clears throat> an isolated kind of peninsula here. So I think Mike might have a little better perspective on how he went through that process and hope well, maybe. Oh, you're on mute, Mike. <laughs> you think I would have learned by now. Um, the paper that Tom did um, that had the case study in Pennsylvania, you know, that was sort of a comprehensive across the municipality, not just municipally owned lands, but across the municipality kind of a strategy. And that is exceedingly rare. Um, I believe that, you know, it, it started out good, but then the township, that municipality in Pennsylvania stopped funding it. Um, you know, what we do in Hopewell Township is very similar to what any nonprofit does. The lands that they have, they try to run a deer management program where they have quotas and things like that. Um, you know, overall in Hopewell Township, there's, you know, maybe 5,000 or so acres out of 40,000 that are under deer management and Jen Rogers, um, uh, you know, does significant amounts of acreage on her properties. Um, it's not having any effect at the township level, none whatsoever. You can get local success, but you're no, absolutely no impact at the municipal level. And, you know, we could keep getting more and more people to do deer management and we all try to do that private landowners whatever but you know there, it seems to me that there needs to be a bigger solution or a much more significant number of landowners um participating 
truly participating. And, and it, it really is a tough thing. Um, you know, a lot of parcels, a lot of landowners, everyone making their own decision. Okay. I mean, I've tried to impress upon the township I live in. I'm on the Environmental Commission to potentially use some of the funding they get for open space, you know, tax dollars to fund a more, you know, uh, aggressive deer management program. Um, I've been unsuccessful, but I think there's, I think there are mechanisms that we could could utilize to fund it and to find solutions. I think the panelists next will will probably talk more about those kind of things. Though. Yeah. No, I think that's right, Tom. I think that, that's a good segue that we, what we want to do is have our second panel really um, respond and and talk about the implications of this research and, and what it's going to take to take some of these uh, these measures that were successful at Duke Farms to scale and, and to transfer them into, into different settings. So um, I, I would encourage our, our panelists from the first panel to go into the Q&A and look at some of the other um, more detailed questions that were raised and to the extent that you can, uh, you know, you can type some responses to those and we'll also try to come back to some of those as well. But I think it's important that we hear from our, our second panel and I think they're probably gonna get to some of the issues that people have raised in the, in the questions as well. Um, so we have, we have a, great, a great panel of experts that um, have experience with these issues um, as, uh, uh, as, as, land, as land managers um, and in the academic sector. So uh, we're joined by Jen Rogers, who's Director of Stewardship for the Mercer County Park Commission. And she joined the, uh, the commission as the county naturalist in 2008. And uh, thanks to her dedication, uh, the uh, county advanced both environmental education and um, uh, uh, environmental education department uh, and stewardship department at the Park Commission. And as, a, as director of stewardship, Jen focuses on raising awareness of and advancing stewardship efforts to create healthy ecosystems within and beyond the boundaries of Parkland and Mercer County. We're also joined by Dr. Danielle Shevitz, uh, who is the executive director and an associate professor for Kane University School of Environmental and Sustainability Sciences. She is an ethnobiologist and restoration ecologist with a PhD in ecosystem science from the University of Washington. And she um, got her BS and MS from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and uh, Forestry. And she serves as president-elect of the Society of Ethnobiology and vice president of the Hanson Park Conservancy. And she sits on the board of the New Jersey Higher Education Partnership for Sustainability. And lastly, we're joined by Marty McHugh, who is regional manager for Sumco Eco Contracting, uh, which focuses on the specialized field of ecological construction and is in the forefront of restoring wetlands, streams and rivers, wildlife habitats, coastal resources, and associated stormwater infrastructure. He has 35 years of experience in the public and private sector. Um, 26, years of, uh, tw 26 of those years were at New Jersey DEP, where he held uh, various positions. Um, too numerous to mention, but I'll mention that he was counselor to the commissioner um, and director of the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. And of course, in that role in particular, um, you know, he dealt very squarely with uh, with all of these issues before us today. So, um, so that's our, our our panel, and I want to open it up to um, our uh, our panel of respondents to respond a little bit to what you've heard, and in particular, to focus on this issue of um, you know kind of what are the implications more broadly um, for state land management uh, agencies for county local. Um, and, uh, and, and also as it relates to um, these issues of, uh, you know, climate change and, and, and carbon sequestration, which of course are front and center on, uh, you know, um, uh, people's minds, rightly so, um, these days. So I'm not sure who would like to go first. Um, uh, if you don't mind, Tom, I'd like to go because um, first of all, I, I great study, great paper. Uh, it's been a while since I've, uh, you know, was directing Division of Fish and Wildlife, but, um, you know, in the current uh, role that I'm fulfilling uh, at uh, Sumco, I'm seeing, you know, the damage to forests caused by, uh, you know, over browse and other, and other issues too. Uh, so, it, you know, it's obviously a, a huge issue for New Jersey, let alone the entire Mid-Atlantic and a lot of other places in the country that Jay referred to. Um, and I really appreciate Jay uh, raising the uh, San County Almanac photo there and I have that right here. I, I used to teach at Rutgers from this from the book. Um, uh, and you know, as Aldo said, it's it's a, a lot of it's about people management. 
and uh, and I, I suspect I know who Hazel is and where she's calling from or where she's tuning in from. And um, I was just up in that neighborhood this weekend at a soccer match uh, in a very developed area. Uh, and, uh, and I couldn't believe that I saw four deer trying to cross the road in, in the middle of uh, you know, Park Avenue, uh, you know, where, where there were stores all around and development all around. So I'm you know, fully aware of the issue. It, and it, it, you know, the, the, the work that was done at uh, Duke Farms uh, with everybody and all, you know, the collaboration and the hunters and the scientists and the public uh, was tremendous. Uh, and, you know, I was at Fish and Wildlife when that was occurring um, and uh, really, really want to, you know, give great kudos to everybody who was involved. How translatable that is to the rest of the state, honestly, not sure yet. Um, because, you know, uh, Duke is a, is a very unique place. It's a great place. Uh, it's a real lab for, you know, all of the stuff that we're all trying to accomplish for ecological restoration and, and, and climate change. And, um, and, and hopefully it can be translated, but it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated issue uh, in this state. Uh, but uh, as I used to teach at Rutgers um, at Cook, uh, you know, all things get uh, addressed in New Jersey first a lot of times, right? Because we face these problems early on, uh, New Jersey has been in the forefront of a lot, a lot of environmental issues and why not try to get in front of this as well? Um, you know, the Division of Fish and Wildlife uh, has, has done a lot to try to uh, get our, our management of the herd down over the years. Um, and um, as, I, as I let folks know on this panel before, uh, uh, sorry, I just get my door shut. Um, you know, way back before I, I came to Fish and Wildlife, we were having a hard time getting uh, hunters to actually take does in a harvest. And there's a book wrote, written about it called Doe Day. So I, I, I commend everybody to, to read that. Um, and I think uh, over the years, we've really, you know, come a long way to dealing with our, with our, our deer management issues. Um, but, you know, New Jersey is a kind of a perfect storm state. I'll wrap this up in a second. Um, but uh, you know, our forests were cut at the turn of the century, as, uh, as Tom mentioned. Uh, and then now they're, uh, you know, they're, they're in great, they're great habitat for deer. We also have 1.5 over one, Tom, you probably know this better than I do uh, with the latest figures, 1.5 million acres of open space in the state, thankfully, uh, public open space. Uh, that's actually more than the state of Maine, by the way. Um, and then you have climate issues, right? And then you have suburbia, 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 that big red blob that you saw going across the screen in Somerset County is going across the screen all over New Jersey. That's a great slide from Rick Lathrop. Um, and so you have a perfect storm of conditions in the garden state, right? We're the most diverse state on the East Coast. That's why we're called the garden state. We have species in Maine that are here, species in South Carolina are there here. So, you know, it's basically a perfect storm for, for deer, for bear, for other animals. Um, and, uh, and now as a result of the, you know, a lot of other conditions, you know, invasives. So um, I'll, lay, I'll just put that down on the table right now. Uh, it, it's complicated. And, um, and then also you have a change in culture here. Uh, when I first, you know, I grew up in New Jersey, when I started hunting, it was a little different back then. Today, the culture uh, with respect to hunting is, is different. So uh, uh, not so welcoming and not so easy. And we have a decline of, of our hunter base. So, um, so you have all that as a backdrop. Now we, can answer, now we can try to answer the questions, right? So. Jen, did you wanna talk first about the municipalities and what you're doing? I thought, and then I'll talk. Sure, does that make sense? Tom. Sure, okay, it. great. So um, again, we at Mercer County have been implementing deer management in our parks for the last decade. Um, and I would say that most of our deer management has really been inspired by the folks that were on this first panel. Um, so, you know, I am uh, very thankful for having years of experience um, with Jay and Tom and Mike. And um, I think what's important, not important, I feel like I have three minutes and I want to put like 30 minutes of thoughts and <laughs> excitement into just a few minutes, guys. So I'm going to try to pack it all in. But um, we've been able to grow our deer management in the last decade from 
1,600 acres. Um, and just for perspective, right now, um, county parks uh, total to about seven, just over 7,000 acres within the county. If we add our open space into that, that's about 10,000 acres total in Mercer County. Um, so in 2010, we had 1,655 acres in deer management. That was Bald Pate Mountain. Um, today, at the end of our deer management season, we're at 3,977 acres um, that have aggressive deer management on them. And um, a lot of this has been, you know, painful to grow, um, but it was supported greatly by the research, you know, that we've been able to conduct on our own lands, but then also use from Jay and Tom and Mike. And so <clears throat> I think what I might do with the few minutes I have is share my screen. And I just wanna show everyone who's with us today, um, some of the work that we've been able to do in one of our largest parks, but also one of our most active use parks, and that's Mercer County Park. And Mercer County Park is within West Windsor Township, Hamilton Township. Uh oh, and I think it has a little bit of Lawrence in it too. Um, but in the we've been implementing deer management there for three years, and I've seen some really exciting results as far as deer harvest, um, but we'll also see some of the things Mike was talking about and Jay was talking about in the really slow response from plants. So give me one second, folks. I'm gonna try sharing my screen here. Aha. Okay, um, my slides are not pretty. Uh, they just have a bunch of stuff on them, but um, I don't think I have time to kind of really talk about <clears throat> everything that we've been doing on a county level. Um, I really want to get to this map here. So in 2018, we performed our first spotlight count survey of Mercer County Park. Um, here is the map showing all of the point counts that uh, had deer and their numbers. I want to bring everyone's attention. Oh, there's my mouse to this pink line in here with all of these dots on them, the red and orange dots. Uh, this is Paxson Avenue for those of you who may be familiar with the park. Um, and we've got quite a nice, not nice, sorry, quite a dense showing of deer here. Um, and then also he, uh, this portion, sorry, is the East Picnic area of Mercer County Park. And so this was our deer spotlight count survey in 2018. The, our numbers at this point, uh, we estimated 70 deer per square mile, um, and then after birthing, 104 deer per square mile. Um, this year, in March of 2021, uh, I want you guys to look again, here's Paxson Avenue, <laughs> uh, way, way less point counts for deer. I know that's really scientific, way, way less. I hope Mike Van Cleef is shaking his head as in, yes, Jen, that is very scientific. Um, and then here's East Picnic area again. So we've been able to, um, through using state licensed hunters only, drop our deer density in 2018 from 70 deer all the way down to 32 deer. We do not have any deer exclosures in this park. Um, we have not performed any deer drives in this park. The <clears throat> main force behind this uh, drastic drop in deer numbers is really the utilization of, sorry guys, uh, is the utilization of high harvest or uh, hunters, um, which we call our deer management hunters. They make up a really small portion of our deer management team or you know the individuals that participate in our deer management plans but um one of the things we've been able to do is kind of uh encourage all of our hunters to become deer management hunters because as they become more efficient in our program they actually end up getting access to new parklands that have never been hunted so um <clears throat> in addition to this we also had a a uh, drone survey performed at Mercer County Park this year that estimated our deer at 36 per square mile. Um, so, you know, these numbers are being backed up um, by these different survey methods. And then, oh, here is our harvest, which has exceeded those that 40% every um, year. So 139 deer were harvested um, in 2018, 19. Yes, 2018 to 19 season. Um, and then we've harvested 
oh, I don't have my numbers, um, 70, nine deer, I think in 2019, and then in our, about 76 deer, um, or exactly 76 deer um, this past season. And so while we've seen drastic drops in our deer numbers, what hasn't changed yet, and we, you know, I think are expecting this is just the change in deer browse and the change in our cover. So native cover is still um, dropping from 2018 to 2020. And then same thing with non-native cover uh, dropping I'll take that though. <laughs> um, and then the last bit, since I feel like I'm over time, um, I do wanna share just this last bit, right? So our deer management program, again, relies on um, state licensed hunters, not sharpshooters at this point, but um, I think this graph is probably true of all of us who run deer management programs right now. So these are all of our hunters, along the x-axis here and then you know each bar and each uh space that is not represented <laughs> all the way out to zero um are our 116 hunters that were part of our season this year and we can see how many deer each individual hunter harvested and so the majority of our hunters are in the one two four or five deer range um, and then, you know, a lot of the success of our deer management lies in these, you know, four to six individuals um, with one individual harvesting 50 deer in our programs just this year. Um, and so, you know, we have, again, been able to grow our deer management programs. I think, you know, we're looking at adding open space, um, again, being a majority landowner in our county, we realize the role we have um, in managing forests and reducing deer populations. Um, but I'm sorry, the last bit I want to <laughs> last bit I want to end on is just um, our age class. And I know we all have been talking about how um, you know we're falling out and losing hunters. And as I was reviewing some of the data in our harvest report, I did find it encouraging um, that people younger than me, well, that's all of this right here, um, are actually getting back into hunting. And so, you know, while it's not an enormous percentage of our um, hunters in the program, you know, we do have it is it is present, and hopefully, this number will grow a little more in the coming years. Also, um, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and I think what I'll do is just let Daniela speak. And I know I'm just going to stop so otherwise I'll keep talking, but uh, I'll let Daniela speak and then we can all chat and answer questions. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Um, so actually, I know that we're very, uh, we're running late on time. So I'm just going to summarize what I was going to say very quickly and be happy to answer any questions. And that's easy because the work that I'm presenting is actually work that we are planning to do. So I'm a professor at Kane University and we have our students who have worked as environmental consulting firms sort of in that model for their senior seminars. And we always work with clients. And, um, our client a couple of years ago was Union County Parks. And we worked with um, them on a deer education strategy. And my students really trained with um, Jay Kelly just to kind of see the methods that they use, but more importantly, worked with the community to really understand their perception of deer impact. And um, it was in a really interesting for me because I've been living in New Jersey for 15 years, but really got to see the Wachong, which I spend every day at in the summertime normally from a different perspective from the neighbors and seeing the impact that and the interactions that they have with their, their community. Now, Kane University has a new sky, we call it the Skylands Campus, it's in the Highlands region um, by Jefferson and Oak Ridge. And it is gorgeous, an intact forest and great native diversity, but there's also a lot of deer there. So what I would talk about and what I will be talking about hopefully for many years in the future is a long-term study that we're setting up both at Wachung Reservation and um, in the Oak Ridge area or in the, by, in the Skylands campus. And that will be very much of a combination of the work that you've heard today, as well as the New York City Carbon Accounting Study that's long-term. So um, we are looking at incorporating uh, areas that we are going to be long-term monitoring for. Um, some will have deer exclosures and some will not in both of those habitats. And we're going to be looking at how deer are affecting carbon sequestration and carbon flux 
plant diversity and invasive, in particular native and invasives using the same techniques that were done at Duke Farms and also additional nutrient cycling. So the idea is to make it more of a, a, a holistic approach to understanding the impact of deer in these two different habitats. And it's a model that we could take to other areas too, but really looking at the longer term impacts of, um, of deer on these areas. So that's basically the work that we will be doing in the future, um, setting, starting this summer, um, especially at the Skylands campus, having students involved with every aspect from plot creation and monitoring all the way through the end, so that they really understand that you cannot have forest regeneration without managing for deer. Um, and so there really needs to be an understanding of how that one element can control everything from the nutrients that we don't see to the plants that we do see. And like Jay was talking about the insect diversity and all the other animals that come with having a healthy forest. So I'm gonna stop so that we have time for questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to throw in a couple other things that um, I thought about as I was listening to Jen and that's a great, great project that Danielle is going to be doing and what Jen is doing in Mercer County Parks is again, you know, it's, it's a really, it's going a long way to help. Um, I talked to the director of Fish and Wildlife in preparation for this, Dave Golden, and our license sales are up 17% over the last year. Now, whether that's because people were home or, or because of what was going on, but that's a good indication uh, because we had been losing hunters, uh, in, you know, uh, into, into, into the deer management um, program. Uh, the other thing is it's time, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, that guy who, who, uh, who harvested, and I'll say guy, it could be a woman, right, um, who harvested 50 deer must have a lot of time on his hand. All of our time is, you know, is, is, is difficult now, to, you know, and, and to get out because of the way things are fast paced. So that's it. That's a barrier to this. Another barrier is access, hunter access, right, and convincing landowners to allow hunters onto their property. So that's something that could be, uh, uh, needs to be addressed. And then lastly, uh, we have a program that we started it in 1997. Actually, we didn't start it, 300 started it called Hunters Help on the Hungry. And uh, especially now with uh, the impacts from the, uh, the pandemic and the, and the need at the food banks, um, there has to be a way to ramp up uh, the funding for the processing of meat that's donated uh, through Hunters Help on the Hungry. And uh, that would be something that I think uh, we should all get behind. I started a program uh, for using uh, the commercial bycatch uh, from the, uh, from the uh, actually a foundation for the commercial bycatch from the commercial fishing industry to process that bycatch to, um, to the food banks. It's called uh, America's Glean Seafood in the same vein. And that's really getting a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of need for it. Uh, in the same vein, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that for, uh, for deer management, and maybe even goose management at some point in the future, which is something that I wanted to look into when I was at uh, Fish and Wildlife, but couldn't get, couldn't get going. So there's those, 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 those issues that, you know, some could help, but thankfully we're seeing an increase in, you know, in hunter uh, participation. So, so let me just um, pose some, some kind of final questions to the panel before we wrap up. I mean, it seems that the, you know, the ingredients for success here, when we think about what worked at, at Duke Farms and, and here, Jen, in terms of some things that have been successful in Mercer County uh, parks, um, in both cases, there were um, very, you know, aggressive uh, hunting programs, right, that were clearly designed to reduce the herd. Um, and then um, certainly in um, at Duke Farms, you know, the exclosure was, um, you know, uh, made a big difference, right? The impact, the, the, the results within, within the exclosure were much greater than without. So, those, so those, are, those seem to be sort of two of the most important tools that we're identifying here. Um, so, so what do we need to change, right? What do we need to do to make... Um, those types of approaches uh, more possible um, in more places. I mean, do we need more, you know, do we need more funding, more funding available for uh, creating deer exclosures? What, you know, how do we need to change um, uh, our hunting, you know, programs and policies so they'll be more effective at um, reducing the deer herd and, 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 and or what other thoughts might you all have in terms of, um, again, about taking these successful examples um, to scale, to, to deal with the problem. 
One of the things that uh, in our early discussions about this meeting with Mike, uh, Mike Van Cleft brought up, I thought was a, a valid point we need to bring up today is we really need to change the uh, paradigm and what people, uh, what hunters value in hunting and what they see as their role. And I know that's a huge shift, um, but um, th there's two different ways we should do that. I mean, the, the, the overall philosophy is, is still, you know, hunt the bucks, don't hunt the does. Uh, that's a huge shift and it's, it's starting to move differently. But the bigger shift is actually perception, hunter perception. Once you get to a certain level, uh, I don't remember if it's 30 or 50 deer per square mile, the average hunter sees that there's not enough deer, which is still too high for forest re regeneration. So we need to somehow figure out how to educate uh, our hunters and or enact policies through the uh, fish and wildlife to increase that, um, that take, I should say, of females. Um, that was your point, right, Mike? There's a perception, like a yeah. hunter's perception. Well, you want to answer that, Mike? Go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah. I, I guess what I'm hearing, though, it sounds to me like, um, I guess the question I would ask is, can we get there through recreational hunting? Or, I mean, what I'm hearing, there were very specific programs at Duke Farms and Mercer County Parks that were tailored to reduce the herd. And it was separate and apart from recreational hunting. So I'm just wondering if, you know, where do we... Yeah, I mean, there, has, there has to be, you have to use multiple strategies. Like I said, we used an ag depredation permit. We used uh, sharpshooters. <laughs> I mean, a, a lot of that is based not, you know, people will say, well, it's because Duke has all that money. But the ag depredation permit didn't cost us any money. And it's super effective. I mean, you're able to go out at nighttime and target deer when you know they're most vulnerable. Uh, there's there's a lot of different tools that we could use that I don't think are being utilized across the region as much as it could be. That's true. I mean, there's I usually put it in using effective inefficiency, right? So um, or access <laughs> and efficiency in this case. Um, you know, in Hopewell, about 40% of the land area is not accessible to hunting. That's clearly a huge and significant problem. But where you do have access, you don't have effective deer management at all. You know, it's very much buck based. Even though lots of does are getting harvested, it's not enough to move the needle. And, you know, so yeah, getting as many landowners on board doing deer management. But I could tell you one thing, you're gonna run out of management hunters really quick. There aren't that many. It takes a lot of expertise and it takes a lot of their time and money. Um, and, you know, we all try to sort of lead by example, right? Like, oh, private landowner, you should do what we do on our preserve or whatever. Um, and, you know, that's only going to go so far. There really has to be some bigger thinking on strategies. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I know that we, we talked about, oh, we, we had talked in our initial discussions about uh, commercial harvest and, and making venison available for commercial harvest. Now that was all stopped in the 1900s because of, you know, we, we wiped out the entire deer population and the Lacey Act was approved. And, um, <clears throat> but Bruce Barber, I see in the quotes uh, in, the, in the comments was asking that question. That, that may be one, our silver bullet, um, potentially, um, particularly in these areas where there are you know, we're a very urbanized uh, state and uh, a lot of the questions are how do we manage deer on these urbanized tight areas where there's not where all the deer are running around in people's backyards well there might be a, a way of of that working into the system where it might help us reduce the herd even greater not not without controversy of course but you know we have to like pull a band-aid off here and say we can't we need to move forward instead of worrying about everyone's sensitivities towards you know what is a historical thing that our our population has always done yeah, that's going to be that's going to be tough, um, but it's not something that shouldn't be off the table. Maybe it is a tool um, uh, and it should be explored. But, um, you know, you have a system that's you know, the North American model of wildlife management, which, Tom, you're right, is based on what happened in the 1900s and where we were at. Uh, uh, maybe maybe the nail is and the hammers are different now um, than they were back then. But, um, you know, I think the other issue is in this state, I mean, really, hunters, uh, the, the pursuit of hunting or the heritage of hunting is not always welcomed. And I think there's going to have to be some help in turning that around. You know, hunters, as you all know, 
have you know and the and the man and the management of wildlife has funded a lot of uh uh, programs over, you know, with excise taxes, hunting licenses, purchase of property, all of that. And, you know, there has to be some recognition of that. And then maybe some assistance uh, and some other uh, organizations or groups to come in and some, uh, some, some funding available to and, and maybe some change some perceptions of, of the pursuit of hunting. Uh, it's good to see 17%, uh, you know, increase in license sales. But, you know, uh, they're part of the management of our of our wildlife, and they need you know, and um, and something needs to be done in that vein uh, in order to make this make this work in the state. Just I mean, like, we, I, we, I, oh, I really ahead. believe that it comes down to money, right? So if there is that incentive for people to help manage the deer population, including farmers who clearly have an economic loss because of deer. Right, so having that incentive for them to be able to manage the deer on their own property really can have a significant decrease. It doesn't help places like where I live in suburbia where the houses are on top of each other, but for the places where they, there can be some sort of commercial gain when you, you know, sell deer meat, that's got, it, it's, it makes sense to bring it back on the table. Well, you know, we have a very we have a very complicated system of wildlife management, <laughs> right? So this is the digest, right? And I know the division because I worked there for a number of years. I know the division is working really hard uh, to uh, to tailor, uh, you know, uh, harvests in the areas where there are the highest densities. Um, and uh, I mean, I think we we shot. I think we took fifty thousand deer last year. And I forget how many millions of pounds were, or excuse me, thousands of pounds were, were donated. But um, I think you're right, Danielle. I think it's going to come down to some funding, right? Some additional funding for this and the recognition of what this means to our ecosystem. All right. But also some public, some help with public perception about, you know, about hunting. Uh, you, you know, that you're, I'm seeing questions in the chat, you know, we, my, uh, you know, there's feeding going on in, in my neighborhood and I can't raise it because, you know, of, of, this, of, the, of the pushback on that, where we would like to open up a different area, but I'm getting pushback. Uh, so there needs to be some help uh, to the traditional, you know, hunting organizations from the ecological, you know, concerned ecological community uh, with uh, educating the public about this. And we haven't seen that in the past. Yeah. We're, we're all on the same page. I know you all are, but you know, there needs to be some additional work there. I mean, the one, thing, one of the things that's really, New Jersey has been great at is preserving land, protecting land. What we've been really poor at is stewarding that land. So there has to be, I mean, a, a real simple way, not, not necessarily simple, but a real low hanging fruit would be use some of that open space money to steward it. Mm -hmm. I mean, properly steward. I mean, I, I know that's not as easy as it sounds, but there are, there are funding mechanisms out there that we're using for other things that we could utilize towards the stewarding of our, our lands. I mean, it's, I, I totally yeah. agree. I'm just curious, Tom, did you have uh, public, uh, I can't remember, uh, but did you have public issues associated with, the, with what you were doing at Duke? Uh, very little. Uh, we did have some, uh, a very local, very loud, small group. Mm -hmm. um, we invited them in. We showed them around, we talked to them, we um, explained our process, we told them we weren't demonizing the deer, we were trying to balance the ecosystem, and that worked for us. It, it, she, went, she and her group went away, um, they left us alone. Um, but you know, it took effort, it took me spending, you know, uh, Gene Huntington and I, I think Gene's on this meeting as yeah. well, I think he and I spent, you know, several days, you know, working on that relationship to, on, for her. I don't think she ever agreed with us, but she agreed to disagree and moved on, so. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are, we are out of time, and this is such a, a, um, a, a rich uh, topic, and I know we could, uh, we, we could continue on um, and, and still not, not, not do it justice, but, um, but we do need to wrap up, and uh, I want to thank all of our, our panelists. I want to thank the, the researchers, um, for your great work over many years and, and Duke Farms for partnering with us on this and, and our panelists for sharing their expertise. And I'm gonna turn it back to Nora for any uh, any final, final comments. 
Thanks. Um, thank you for joining us today. This is great. Um, this is, I do want to uh, comment and say that uh, I think it's kind of obvious to everybody that if we're going to make that 80 by 50 uh, goals and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, that something needs to be done with um, hunting um, and landscape restoration, uh, forest restoration in the state. So I think that's become more than evident. Um, one of the things um, that we're doing at Duke Farms, and this is, I'm just going to put it in there, that this is probably the first step in research being published out of Duke Farms, um, one of the first steps. We do have a multi-year uh, partnership with Rutgers University. Um, they are um, looking at our uh, soil carbon, and hopefully our goal and our hope is that through this research that we will show, that restoration does make a difference in soil carbon levels. Um, so uh, look out for that. Uh, we're still in data collection mode. Um, so, but I do wanna say thank you for all of uh, the practitioners um, and the researchers on this call. This is fantastic. Um, we will, for everybody who's attending this, this will be uploaded to YouTube. So we'll send that out to anybody who registered and you can distribute that more widely if you find it um, useful for um, people that you know or members in your organization, um, as well as we'll take the Q&A. And there were a lot of really great questions that came through there. And we'll put that as part of the um, the package that we send out to everybody. And hey, I Nora. think that is it. Yes. Uh, I will say that I tried to do as many as I could while we were talking, answer them. But maybe we could somehow send it out to the, the listserv after we're done. Yes. Uh, the answers to some of the questions that we didn't get to. I see 33 on here now. So I think I answered yeah. 10. So. Yeah, I think we need to have more programs. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's telling me. So thank you very much. Um, unless anyone has any kind of parting words, I'm going to hit end and um, we can go on our days. Great. Thanks, thank everyone. you so thank much. You.